Good to have you uh, here for our Bible class today, and uh, we've got some visitors and relatives and, uh, um, and then the rest of us <laughs> here today. Good to have you here for our Bible class. We're studying out of 1 Samuel, and I think that, uh, I think that it's a great study, and hopefully uh, you'll get a lot about, uh, out of the lesson for today. If you will, please bow with me as we begin our class. Heavenly Father, it's our desire to, to worship and praise you uh, in, in even our Bible class today. Uh, as we look into the scriptures, Father, we hope that we'll learn things that uh, help us learn about faith, uh, about how to live, uh, about you. And we pray, Father, you would bless the class to that end. Uh, please bless uh, me as a teacher today uh, to be able to go through these uh, texts and uh, leave people with something to ponder and think about uh, uh, as they go home. Help those who listen to look past the imperfect teacher to the perfect word and be inspired by it. We thank you, Father, for your blessings. We pray this class will honor you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So uh, you, we want this class to honor God. Uh, you'll remember we do this every week. I, I, it, it's a little redundant, but I want to always keep our mind uh, focused. Uh, how healthy is your heart? You know, it's not just history of ancient Israel that we're studying here, but we're trying to look at things that we can apply in some way, and we hope that we'll look at our heart. This particular book, of course, is one about the heart, and uh, this great passage in 1 Samuel 16, verse 7, reminds us that God is more interested on what's going on inside than he is about what's going on outside. The heart is vitally important to God. Today we're going to talk about the heart of faith, and primarily we're going to be in chapter 14, you would think, but we're going to actually be reading an awful lot in chapter 13 as well. And so if you have your Bibles, uh, you're going to want to, to follow along. I think it would be helpful, especially in the beginning of the class, as we go through uh, the text itself. And, and uh, way too many verses to, uh, to uh, put up on the screen. So I really encourage you to open your Bibles and look with me. Israel is under very difficult times. I mean, things are not going well at all for them. And uh, while they've had some victories, uh, uh, and, and in previous chapters we read about the Amal Amalekites being beaten rather firmly by, by Saul and uh, the Israelites, but uh, now they're up against another foe, and that foe uh, are, is the, the Philistines. You probably know a lot about the Philistines. Uh, the Philistines come uh, up quite often also uh, in the book of, uh, or, or with, with Daniel, as he goes through uh, exploits that are remembered for all times. It was the Philistine that he squares off against, uh, called Goliath, for instance. There are uh, times when when he encounters defeat and victory both uh, at the hands of the Philistines. So we're going to have, um, we're going to have to know them and know them well because they come up again and again in 1 Samuel. So what we're going to do is we're going to open our Bibles to uh, 1 Samuel chapter 13. Uh, this, this particular section I entitled, you know, A Time of Hiding. Uh, Despite previous victories, as I said, uh, they are terribly outnumbered, and uh, the Israelites are not prepared uh, to battle. You probably know that at that time, and in most of the ancient world this was true, there weren't large standing armies. We have a professional army in the United States that, that is always ready to go to war. They, they do not have uh, farms to take care of or animals to feed. Uh, you know, crops to, to harvest. Uh, they, they are dedicated warriors. It wasn't that way with the Israelites. The Israelites were a farming community, a farming civilization. Uh, the people were, were somewhat uh, backwards in many ways as far as uh, civilizations of that time go. Uh, and uh, uh, they would have to be called out to fight, but then they'd have to be released again to go back to the fields. Now, that shouldn't be all that sh shocking. That was certainly true in the United States. For instance, in the Civil War, uh, large armies were called out, but they were called away from their farms. And then uh, there were times when they would be released and they would go back. 
uh, but uh, uh, life has to go on. So here uh, for uh, Israel, uh, that's what partly is happening. So I'm going to pick it up in verse 1 of chapter 13. And if you'd like, please come with me. We're going to be looking at this time of hiding. Uh, Saul lived for one year and then became king, and he reigned for two years over Israel. And Saul chose 3,000 men of Israel. 2,000 were with Saul in Michmash and the hill country of Bethel, and 1,000 were with Jonathan in Gibeah of Benjamin. I would assume that this is the professional soldiery uh, of Saul. Uh, previously, and, and, and soon, we're going to see 600 mentioned again, but this is a smaller number than what's necessary to fight a full-blown war when they would be called out to be with him. Yes, sir? Yes, it should. It should. Uh, I'm preaching out of Isaiah, so I got Isaiah on the mind. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 13. Oh, I said it again. Uh, okay, are, are you with me? 1 Samuel 13. Okay, 1 Samuel 13. So 2,000 were with Saul at Michmash and the hill country of Bethel, and 1,000 were with Jonathan in Gibeah of Benjamin. Now, those place names probably mean very little to us, other than what you should know is at Michmash, there's going to be a large garrison of Philistines. And across a gorge that goes east to west, on one side is Michmash, and on the other side is the territory that Saul and Benjamin uh, are holding. Uh, the, his son, Jonathan, is in Gibeah. Gibeah is, by the way, the seat of the government at that time. You probably think about uh, Jerusalem as the seat of the Israelites, but at this time, uh, at this time, uh, Jerusalem is held by the Canaanites still. Uh, it is not in the possession of uh, Israel. That's going to change very soon because uh, David's going to claim Jerusalem as his city. And so we're just uh, not that many years away from, from David stepping up and, and, and seizing Jerusalem and making that his capital. So uh, the, the amount of space, uh, sometimes when, you, when you're thinking about these place names, you have no idea of what the distances are. But Gibeah is about seven miles from Jerusalem. And so uh, it is uh, nor north and a little bit west of Jerusalem. So seven miles isn't that far, is it? Unless it's hill country and you're on foot. And so uh, that might be a little bit farther than you think of seven miles. But uh, that's nevertheless where the capital is. And, and Jonathan is there initially in uh, Gibeah. Uh, where Saul has a very small little fortress, you might say. It has been excavated, by the way, and it's quite uh, primitive. And, uh, you know, uh, if, in fact, what they discovered is Saul's uh, little capital. But it's nothing like the majestic capitals you think about that a king would have with drawbridges and, and torrents, torrents and, uh, uh, you know, huge walls. It's, it's quite sm a bit smaller than that. All right, I, I continue. So it says then, the rest of the people he sent home, every man to his tent. And so uh, uh, the standing army is, is not called together at this time, this moment of time. Uh, they've gone back to their farms to take care of business, you know, do whatever needs to be done, I suppose. But that's when problems happen. Uh, Jonathan defeated uh, the garrison of the Philistines, that was at Geba, or, and uh, the Philistines heard of it. And Saul blew the trumpet throughout all the land, saying, Let the Hebrews hear. And all Israel heard it, said that Saul had defeated the garrison of, uh, of the Philistines, and also that Israel had become a stench to the Philistines. So, uh, during this, this moment, Jonathan takes advantage of what seems to be a law. Uh, the, the, the Philistines are not assembled yet. Uh, he takes this garrison, and by doing so, he angers the Philistines. The Philistines and Israelites have a funny relationship. I mean, uh, the Israelites are rural and, uh, and uh, uh, a simple people. 
And the Philistines, com uh, in comparison, are quite advanced. Uh, they have uh, uh, large armies uh, with, with swords and uh, armor and uh, chariots and uh, uh, large cities, large fortresses. And uh, they have garrisons around the possession uh, that they're claiming as well as the cities themselves. And so they're, they're, the, they're the powerful country. Uh, they're not like the Amalekites and others that wander in and got defeated. They are the, the neighboring advanced civilization that is going to be a thorn in the flesh. So it says, when this happened, uh, the people were called out to join Saul at Gilgal. Now Gilgal is, is farther to the east, so they're kind of out towards the middle of the country. Uh, there's sort of a, a ridge that runs down through uh, Israel, north-south. And at the pass through that ridge is where the battle's going to be with uh, the Philistines on one side at Michmash and the Israelites on the other side of that, that valley. <coughs> so uh, uh, Gilgal, however, is east of this, this pass, over near just a little bit north, of um, Jericho, or where Jericho was, uh, maybe five to seven miles north of that. So that's, uh, that's the situation we have. So he pulls back away from the immediate battle area. He's going to assemble uh, Israel at Gilgal. And the Philistines mustered to fight with Israel. Uh, 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen and troops like sand on the seashore in multitudes. They came up and encamped at Michmash to the east of beth Aven. And when the men of Israel saw that they were in trouble, for the people were hard-pressed, the people hid themselves in caves and in holes, in rocks and in tombs and in cisterns, and uh, some uh, Israel, uh, Hebrews crossed the fords of the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. Saul was still at Gilgal, and all the people followed him trembling. So that's kind of the setup for this. So uh, it's kind of a dismal beginning to this section because, you know, the Israelites obviously, obviously are, are overtaken by fear. They, they don't have a, a feeling of faith about what's going to happen. And... Uh, uh, you know, I, I don't know about you, but they're hiding, some of them are hiding in wells, in cisterns. Now that's, that, that's just crazy to me. Uh, there was a movie, Blast from the Past, that I started watching yesterday as I was researching for this. No, uh, it, it's about uh, Brandon Frazier grows up in a, I didn't, I didn't get to see but the first 10 minutes, but his father, his father uh, is afraid of nuclear war. And so they build a uh, underground shelter. And then uh, they live in that shelter. In the 60s, there's a scare. And so they, his family goes down into the shelter. And then they stay there for 35 years. And so when they come out, that's supposed to be funny then. I didn't get to the funny part. But anyway, uh, go down into a cistern or into a, a bomb shelter and just stay there waiting, you know, trying, hoping that the... The, the war passes over you and that you survive it. Uh, a lot of fear there. A lot of fear about what's going to happen. So that's the setup for the unlawful sacrifice that we have here now in the chapter. We talked about this section a bit last week. But uh, Saul's there in Gilgal. He summoned the people to come to him. But they're just all scared to death. And uh, while they're waiting... You know, some people have drifted in and some people have gathered. Um, but he waits seven days. And during that seven-day wait, the reason that he's assembled there and waiting is they're going to have a sacrifice to the Lord and ask the Lord to bless uh, what's about to happen, the battle, get guidance from God through Samuel, the, his servant. And uh, Samuel doesn't show up. I mean, they wait seven days past the appointed time. So he waited seven days, the time appointed by Samuel, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the people were scattering from him. So they've already got a small number, and they're already scattering. 
and the forces over there at Micmash that have gathered, uh, I've already announced some of the numbers, but they're like sand on the seashore. They can't be counted. And so that they would feel some trepidation, I think that's just understandable. Wouldn't you? If you'd have been in that same situation, you might say, oh, no, not me. You know, because, you know, they're terrible. And I'm, I'd been, I probably would be afraid. I would be very concerned. Look what happened with COVID. You know, we just locked ourselves in our, our rooms for COVID. Can you imagine if it was tens of thousands of enemy that are going to sweep through our, our land and, and burn our homes and, and kill our cattle and uh, uh, set fire to our fields and, and kill our men? Yeah, they have reason to be afraid, to be concerned. But since he saw the people scattering from him, Saul said, bring the burnt offering here to me and the peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. And as soon as he had finished offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came. And Saul went out to meet him and greet him. And Samuel said, what have you done? And Saul said, when I saw the people were scattering from me and that you did not come within the days appointed and that the Philistines had mustered at Michmash, I said... Uh, the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal, and I have not sought the favor of the Lord. So I forced myself, I like that wording, I forced myself and offered the burnt offering. He knows it's wrong. You know, oh, I didn't want to do it. You know, I didn't want to do the bad thing, but I forced myself to do it. You know, for the good of the people, so that we'd be ready for this battle. I forced myself to do it. It doesn't fool anybody. Uh, and Samuel said to Saul, you have done foolishly. You have not kept the command of the Lord your God with which he commanded you. For then the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. And so God had better plans for what's, uh, than, than what's about to happen. But now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be prince over his people. Because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. And Samuel rose and went from Gilgal. The rest of the people went up after Saul to meet the army. And they went up from Gilgal to Gibeah of Benjamin. And Saul numbered the people who were present with him. About 600 men. I mean the figures are like this, aren't they? You know, I got, I got thousands and there's 2,000 with me here. And there's 1,000 with Jonathan, I'm going to go over to Gilgal, and I'm going to call out the army, and, and there's supposed to have been uh, uh, the kind of result that tens of thousands of Israelites would flock to him, but they're in such fear, hiding all over the place. It is a time of, of fear and hiding. He's, he only counts 600 with him, only 600. So, And Saul and Jonathan, uh, his son, and the people who were present with him stayed at Geba of Benjamin. That's probably no more than a couple, a couple three miles uh, uh, south of, of Michmash, where, where, where the uh, Philistines are encamped. I, I read in, in the text that, that I'm kind of loosely following and today not following at all. You know, he gives the impression that Saul is an incredible coward and Saul is always hiding all the time and, and that he's hiding on the other side of his, his uh, kingdom. It's not true. He's actually quite close to the battle uh, field. And uh, so he's just a short distance in this city. So, but the Philistines encamped at Michmash. And of course, he's here in Benjamin because he's of the tribe of Benjamin. His capital, his city, is Gibeah, uh, which is just real close to Geba. In fact, it's on Geba's on the outskirts of Gibeah, and Gibeah, again, seven miles or so from from Jerusalem. So it says, and raiders came out of the camp of the Philistines in three companies. One company turned towards Ophrah, to the land of Shaul. And the company turned towards Beth Oren, and another company turned towards the border that looks down on the valley of Zeboim, uh, toward the wilderness. So what we're seeing here is a large-scale military effort. And they've split forces up, and the Philistines are spreading out, going to strategic places. And while they go, the next chap or the next paragraph explains that 
in, you, you can't find any weapons anywhere uh, in Israel. And that the situation is pretty dire because they're coming out to fight with sharpened sticks and, and, and clubs and, and things like that. They don't have any metal. Uh, all of the blacksmiths have been retired or killed. Uh, they've been driven up into the hills. There's no place for these people to go to, to get swords made. And as a result, as, for the approaching battle, there are only two swords for the, all of the Israelites. Two swords. Uh, they got, now, apparently, you know, Jonathan and, and Saul have armor as well. Probably not steel armor like you think about uh, when you look at knights in, in England or something during the jousting era. But uh, they, have, they have armor, but they, they have only two swords to fight with. The rest of them are kind of like uh, a, peasant, a peasant army uh, carrying uh, uh, implements and like clubs and, and sharpened poles and sticks and things like that to fight those, an army full of, of very advanced for that time weaponry. So, now there was no blacksmith to be found throughout all the land of Israel, verse 19, for the Philistines said, lest the Hebrews make themselves swords or spears. So that was part of their strategy. Uh, I would assume that this has been employed at this time, they're taking them away, but also uh, uh, in earlier times as well. But every one of the Israelites went down to the Philistines to sharpen his plowshare, his mattocks, his axe, or his sickle. So when they needed some work done, uh, you know, they would go to the Philistines. That's where they, they were dependent upon the Philistines to provide this uh, iron work, this blacksmith work. And the charge was two-thirds of a shekel for the plowshares and for the mattocks and a third of a shekel for sharpening the axes and for setting the goads. So on the last day of battle, there was neither sword nor spear found in the hand of any of the people with Saul and Jonathan. But Saul and Jonathan, his son, had them. And the garrison of the Philistines went out to the pass of Mich uh, uh, Michmash. So here you've got on one side of this this. Uh, pass through the hills, uh, real uh, craggy, uh, rough uh, stone formations that rise up rather quick from the, from the bottom. On one side you have this huge army of the Philistines, and on another side you have the Israelites, but not very many of them, and not all that imposing either, you know, with their their, ac their axes for cutting wood and, uh, sh you know, sh sharpened sticks and, and, and such. All right, that's, that's a good background for what I'm calling the time of hiding, the time of hiding. Uh, hiding in the shade, uh, that's what, uh, I, you know, <laughs> that's what uh, our uh, king is doing. It says you, we find him resting in the with the pomegranates in a cave of pom the pomegranates he's 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 not he's not eager to get into the battle at all so uh we're in this time of hiding uh and there's this hiding in the shade going going on the question i want to ask you is is the church unarmed you know uh, i think of of this this battle force uh, in the time of Saul, there are there are people in it, you know, and they might, in a way, say we are the army, but they're not armed. I mean, uh, they they don't ha they don't have weapons with them. And uh, uh, are we in the church kind of like that? Are we like an army? We're the soldiers of Christ, arise. But we're not ar we don't have armor, we don't have weapons, we're not prepared. Uh, this is the question that was raised by the study book that goes with this class. Uh, in fact, uh, as I was reading, I brought it with me because I wanted to actually, uh, uh, I mean, the author is just incredibly negative. I mean, I'm just thinking, he must be going through a hard time 
at the church where he is at. But uh, as he speaks about it, he says, um, unfortunately, this is the description of many churches today. In many cases, the church appears to be soldiers in the Lord's army, but we face the battle unarmed. We are busy building programs and not faith. <laughs> There's one. Busy building programs, but not busy building faith. Uh, we are busy designing worship assemblies that please us rather than please God. We are busy trying to be happy instead of trying to be holy. Uh, we are busy being busy, but we aren't doing much to defeat the devil. It's a scary thing to battle the devil. It's a lot easier to just play church, he says. And then, uh, well, anyway, what do you think about that? I mean, is there some truth to what he says? Uh, any comments that you might have that uh, might add to, to this thinking? Are we, are we ready to be a fighting force for the Lord? What's the condition of the church as we... We anticipate in a very difficult age when the enemy seems so numerous and we seem so weak and innumerous. Uh, you can kind of see the parallels between their situation with physical war and our situation with spiritual world war. What say ye? What do you say about it? Uh huh. Yes. So Bill, Bill is saying, just so you can all be in on, on this, uh, he said, uh, well, you know, uh, uh, we can be guilty of just coming to Bible classes with the uh, aim of just building ourselves up, you know, getting what we can, you know, trying to be stronger as, as Christians. But we don't have enough classes uh, that equip us to actually fight. And I think he's, he, he intimated that maybe we need some classes on how to answer the questions of, of non-believers, how to, to, to confront uh, people and, and, and teach people uh, to come closer. And I will tell you that just from a long-term perspective and having taught many evangelism classes, if you want to have a poorly attended class, give an evangelism class. Why? Because people are thinking, well, I don't want that. I can go to the such and such class and it will be really encouraging and not, you know, we will really, will have a lot of fun and, you know, or, or that other class over there, that one, that, boy, they sing in that class. I just, I don't want to study at all. I just want to sing. Uh, or, you know, uh, we'll go to this other class. It's all video. There's absolutely no need to do anything but watch the video. And there are all kinds of options that people will take. And while Bill is absolutely right, Having the class doesn't ensure that we actually are going to equip people to fight, you know. Nothing worse than having a soldier who won't pick up the weapon and, 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 and go battle. But that's sometimes the case. So thank you. Thank you for that. Anybody else? Anything you might say about it? Yes. Yes.
Good. Yeah, Duane is just saying that diff there is difficulty, you know, because entertaining people is a way to keep them coming, coming to classes or coming to worship. Uh, the denominations are doing it big time, right? I mean, uh, I mean, with lights and professional musicians and uh, bands and the whole business and, and adding a lot of entertainment value to your Sunday. And uh, so, so we can be tempted to go in that direction, but, but it doesn't prepare anybody for battle. That's, that's, that's a problem when we, when we do that. So we need to remember that really what we need to do is we need to prepare people for battle, you know, um, and, and not just to survive. Uh, run to the cisterns and run to the, the caves and the holes in the ground, you know. You know if people can just survive this horrible difficulty of this time, uh, then we're, we're doing God's work, you know. But uh, uh, we, we, we really are to be God's army. Yes, ma'am. Okay, let me just shorten this. Kathy's saying we're not that bad. But it's more than just having good classes. The people have to take individual responsibility to get out and do these things. And so uh, that's more or less what I, I took from what she said. So anyway, uh, yeah, we need, to, to, we, need to, we need to think about this. We don't want to be an unarmed army. Sir, yes. You know, that is a really good point. And guess who else thought of that? Me. <laughs> there it is. Ephesians chapter 6. You and I, we're on a, we're on a, we're connected here. Okay. Well, here in Ephesians 6 is the passage where you find that. And, uh, this is the section right before it goes through the list, the, the helmet and so on. Uh, so finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against authorities, against cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Now, if you want to see that armor, it starts right where this verse ends. But it tells you you need to put this armor on. So I'm going to talk just a second about the armor, uh, not in Ephesians 6, but looking at some other passages. Uh, the Bible says here uh, uh, to the uh, Corinthian church, uh, the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. So, uh, according to this verse, according to Paul, uh, wait a minute, we do have weapons. Now, whether we're using them or not, uh, you know, that's another question. But there are weapons for us. We don't have to be weaponless. Now, you can, can be weaponless if entertainment is what religion is all about for you. But that's not, uh, that's not God's will. Uh, Ephesians six seventeen among that list of, of the armor of God is this verse. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And there's more in that passage than that. But, but are, do you have this? You know, if you want to be ready to fight, there are weapons. And the number one weapon is what? The Word of God. The Word of God. And by the way, it's not like I used to think when I was a kid and I'd watch a, a show and a a uh, man would fight the, you know, uh, the vampires or the, the wicked devil uh, by 
by carrying a cross or carrying a Bible. You know, I'm safe now. I've got a Bible here. Guess what? The Bible's just paper, right? Physically, the Bible is just paper. But the Word of God, which is in that paper Bible, that's another story. That's divinely powerful. That's a description of the Lord himself. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Do you have that? There are so many people, they have a Bible, but they can't, they can't find anything in the Bible. Is that you? You have a Bible, you believe the Bible, but you don't know where anything in the Bible is. So if you wanted to talk to somebody about salvation, you'd say, well, you know, I think that you ought to be baptized. I can think of one verse in Acts 2.38. But there are others, I just don't know where they are. Or I think you need to repent, but I don't know any verses on repent except Acts 2.38. It, it's sad, you know. We can be like an army. Uh, like an army that's unarmed because we, we're not ready to pick up the sword of the Word of God. And so I guess what I'm saying is that we need to learn it. Yes, sir. Yes. He needed God's blessing. Yes. And the way that God got God's blessing in man was to do the sacrifices. Yes. Saul... We could be like Saul in knowing what needs to be done, but like Saul, not do it without help. Yes. And we need to be careful of that. We need to know the Word so that we stay within the Word as we're reaching out to do these things. So Absolutely. We have to be humble. Uh, we have to be submissive to the Word and to God. And... Uh, you know, I, but, but I do want to encourage you to get into the Word so that it is here. Uh, uh, somebody told me once that uh, somebody that really it believes like I do that you need to memorize some scriptures. And I think he told me that he said, um, uh, what, what, what good is the Word of God if you don't have it with you at a particular time? But if you don't have a Bible in your pocket? You know, or your cell phone these days. Your cell phone's not with you, you can't look it up. Uh, but if you have it in here or in your heart, so to speak, then, then you're always ready to do battle. I think that's what we need to do. So we need the Word of God, uh, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Fighting in the light of day, light of day is what happens in chapter 14. And we have to be really quick with this, and so I'm not going to read the passages. Uh, in, in detail, but in chapter 14, Jonathan decides that he is going to attack, despite the incredible inequality uh, in, in, in uh, armies. And furthermore, he's not going to take what little paltry army they got. He's not even going to take them. He's just going to go up and he's going to go with his armor bearer. You know what an armor bearer is, right? Somebody that bears your armor. <laughs> Right, carries, your armor, carries the armor, carries the stuff for him. Uh, only, the armor bearer doesn't even have a sword. Only Jonathan does. Now, he probably has something else to fight with, a club or whatever. But pretty soon he's going to have plenty of swords to pick from because uh, a lot of men are going to fall in this battle. They decide, he says, I'm going to climb up this, uh, uh, up this uh, canyon wall and I'm, we're going to attack the uh, encampment, the garrison of the Philistines. And so he comes up with this plan. So, uh, so off they go. And uh, let me just get uh, an exact one part of it to read with. It says, uh, Jonathan said to the young man who carried his armor, Come, let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be the Lord, maybe that the Lord will work for us, for, for nothing can hinder the Lord from saving by many or by few. Now this is the key verse to this lesson, verse 6 of chapter 14. Let me read it one more time. He says, it may be that the Lord will work for us, for nothing can hinder the Lord from saving by many or by few. And so, by every calculation imaginable, uh, he's not going to win. But he is believing, placing his faith not in his, his power, but in, in God's power. And there's been plenty of times when God has demonstrated 
how we keep coming through for the minority, you know. Uh, so whether it's Gideon and his 300 or the army marching around Jericho and the walls falling down, God's, God's done some miraculous things. The, the, the Red Sea closing over the uh, attacking army of Egypt, one of the premium armies of the day. And God gives victory. God can give victory. That's what Jonathan is, is trusting in. God can give victory. I'm lost. We're lost. We're outnumbered. We are uh, outarmed. We are technologically inferior. But God can do it. So they climb up the walls and they attack. And uh, in uh, an acre of land as they get to the top, 20 men are, are, are killed. And this is, this is the most... Uh, what would you say? Primal type of fighting. I mean, uh, today you can press a button and rockets take off and people die that you never meet. You know? Um, my my father-in-law was a uh, World War II bomber pilot and uh, he had 20 missions over Germany and uh, you know, I asked him, you know, if he ever thought about the people that died when he dropped his bombs, and he said no. Because he couldn't. He didn't want to think about that. But uh, very separated from the, the deaths of those people that doubtlessly did die from the bombing. But when you're, you've got a sword and you're, you're fighting hand to hand, it's a different story. He kills 20 men. And and does it in this, right at this little opening at the top of the hill. And they, they panic, and they run, and then the ones by them, they run, and they get so mixed up, they start fighting with one another. You say, how's that possible? Because not, they don't all have uniforms like armies do today. And then they don't know who's who, and they start fighting each other. And uh, the battle starts to expand, and all the... Israelites or Hebrews that have joined the Philistines, that's something you don't think about. Um, many, perhaps hundreds of Philistines were, or, or, of Hebrews joined the Philistines in their army uh, because they wanted to survive. But when they saw the courage of what Jonathan and his armor bearer did, they turned on the Philistines as well. And then when that got going, then, then Saul sees the movement as he looks over at the army and he sees the, the unrest and he sees some that are starting to run and there's fighting going on that isn't even the Israelites but they're fighting one another and, and, and in that commotion then he says well let's go guys and he takes his few hundred men and they attack and, and the route begins and then the news comes out the, the Philistines are on the run and all the people come out of their holes and hiding places all these men that, that said I, I'm not, I don't think I'm ready to go out now they join in on the battle. And then they slay them for 17 miles, the route goes, for, for an entire day. God can give you victory even when everything is against you. That's the point I want to make. I pray that you will learn from this lesson that with God, victory is always possible. I hope you will learn the lesson that you need to be ready to fight. I hope you will learn the lesson that you're never unarmed if you have the word of God in your mind and heart. And that that, that weaponry is more powerful than anything else that exists. And that God's plan to gain the world for him is not church services, which is why, how some religious groups are trying to win people by having better entertainment than the next group. But God's plan for evangelism comes from you, 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 us, all of us, carrying the weapons of God with us and doing spiritual battle one-on-one, one-on-one. -on -one. On -one. It's hard, but it is glorious. May God bless us, bless his church that he loves so much to enable us to do what nobody believes is possible.
Heavenly Father, thank you for blessing us with this class. We pray that your will will be done in our lives. Make us courageous soldiers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.